Lisa Lauk, and I am a DNR district forester. I cover four counties here in southeast Iowa, Dean, Des Moines, Henry, and Eliza. And um, I help administer some of the cost share programs that are available through our state and federal um, resources. So I want to talk with you just a little bit about that. And if you have any questions as we go, I think we can answer them as we go, but I will leave uh, time at the end for questions also. And I probably will not take the entire half hour, so that will let you guys go on to um, my gold and more um, uh, exciting speakers than myself with more exciting topics than just cost share. So um, what we have is uh, state and federal programs here in Iowa, and I'll speak a little bit about outside of Iowa. The federal programs apply to everywhere. Our, I looked at the license plates as I walked in. It looks like the majority of you are here from Iowa. Can I see a show of hands of those out-of-state people? Okay, so just a fair number. And so um, part of this will not apply to you, unfortunately. Um, we are very lucky to have a neat program that is unique to Iowa called REAP, and we'll just speak a little bit more about that, um, but then we'll certainly include all the other states and some of the other cost share that may be available to you to start your chestnut farm and to uh, help you get that established. So, cost share is available for actually everything from, can I turn this around? Um, cost share is available for everything from tree and shrub planting, tree planting in your woodlands, which you probably wouldn't be doing for chestnut um, establishment and uh, production, but just want to throw out there that that's some of the reasons that these programs exist and that what people are doing with them. Um, forest stand improvement, which is uh, improving what you have as far as existing woodlands or timber um, to uh, create diversity of species and uh, manage for your goals of wildlife or wood or long-term family enjoyment or whatever those goals might be. Wildlife improvement, which of course, um, you know, goes right along with timber improvement and tree planting, so on and so forth, as well as soil and water conservation, um, which here again goes right along with any kind of tree planting or, or timber improvement practices. Um, when we're managing for uh, putting good um, plants in the ground, we're certainly improving those soil and water uh, resources just as a great aside to that. So. Um, and as we talk about this, you know, one thing to keep in mind, guys, is that all these acronyms and the different programs that might be available, you do not have to walk away today and remember what program you think you're going to go into or what exactly practice within a program you think will apply to you. You just have to have an idea of what your project is, what your goals are, both long and short term, and what you would like to see out of the end result, um, and that will help us fit a program um, with you as far as that goes. So um, for, if you remember nothing else from my talk today, it is that just coming to see your district forester, your natural resources, conservation service, NRCS, or soil and water district, they're the same office there housed in every county kind of along with your farm services agency in that same office, um, or even your Pheasants Forever wildlife biologists, or outside sources like Practical Farmers, Trees Forever, or some of these uh, county extensions. You know, a lot of these same folks can get you in touch with the people that you need to get with to um, look at some of these programs. So, the programs that we're going to mainly cover today are going to be the state program that I mentioned called REAP, Resource Enhancement and Protection. And then our federal programs, mainly I'm going to talk about EQIP, which is Environmental Quality Incentive Program. Um, it used to fall under WIP, which was Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program. And, you know, that's one of the reasons we don't want to tax you with uh, remembering the exact program or practice because where it's the government, they change kind of often. And so um, uh, here again, uh, the dames might change, but some of those same resources are there. And then, as I mentioned, there might be local, research-oriented, um, especially for things like, you know, growing food, um, local uh, products, that type of thing. I think that there's so much more out there here again through things, uh, organizations like Practical Farmers, organizations like Trees Forever, um, uh, an RCD resource conservation and development that are located in certain areas throughout the state of Iowa. Um, and so there might be a whole lot, as well as possible university. I know of a few people who have done different plantings that you know were part of a research grant. Um, so here again, something that you might be doing could fit with that and checking with some of those resources that are available to you before you start 
um, might be um, good to make sure of uh, what might be available so you can make those best decisions for you. So um, the state program that is unique to Iowa, Resource Enhancement Protection, and some of you guys, I saw the license plate out there in the parking lot. It's the deer and the pheasant and the uh, trout and um, the songbirds and the different things like that. And um, part of that money that when you buy that license plate goes to this REAP fund. And it's a really, really neat program that actually is funded every year through the legislator. It's never been fully funded at the 20 million mark, but it's gotten close. And um, within REAP, it is a large pie that goes to many different sources, including historic sites, parks and management. Um, and then uh, luckily, each of our 99 counties in Iowa, every July, get a pool of money to use for uh, cost share, um, excuse me, for conservation practices to provide cost share reimbursement to landowners to do a conservation practice. Those might include prairie, tree plantings, timber stand improvement, and so um, we'll get into that a little bit. Again, um, only in Iowa. So this program, um, when the funds come every July, which is the beginning of our federal fiscal year, or state fiscal year, I guess, um, they uh, are allocated to the counties. Each county in Iowa, through their county committee of the Soil and Water District, actually decides before those funds get there how they're going to be allocated. Some that maybe don't have a lot of forest resources in their county um, might allocate more every year to terraces or some other conservation practices that they deem more important in their county. And if the funds are never applied for a forestry practice in that county, they, they might not be allocating as much there. And so, um, you know, REAP as a program is a really neat and um, uh, you can get involved and be active within that program by going to annual REAP meetings that help to determine um, what some of the money goes for, what some of the good and bad of the program is, and give feedback on that every year. And then also, you can give feedback through your county committee if you don't like how your county is allocating their funds. These are elected officials, and this is a public um, meeting that you're allowed to go to. And so if there ever, ever there was a question, we have a lot of outlets in which to um, voice our opinion or um, our wants for different uses of some of those funds. So kind of a neat, and you know, again, we, we kind of own that program in all reality. And so um, I think that's really neat, neat for Iowa. So when that money comes every July, as it's allocated out within the county, so much is allocated for tree practices, planting and timber stand improvement, and that is on a first come, first serve basis. The four counties I cover here in Iowa, um, Lee County in the very southeast tip of Iowa is the only one that really runs out of those funds every year. There's such a waiting list for forestry programs. It runs out, and I know it does in some other counties throughout the state, again, where there's a heavier forest resource or a heavier need of planting and that kind of thing. In my other counties, in all honesty, a lot of years, we don't use up those funds. And so something that I always encourage people is, you know, if you're already going to be doing a program or a project, check and see if there's a program available to you because these funds are here and we want you to use them. That's what they are allocated for. That's what we fight for and, you know, get them there for every year. And so um, please check it out and see if we want you to use those. Um, so an important rule about the REAP program is that it has an acre minimum for different projects. If you're going to plant trees, you have to do three acres. Now that three acres can be an acre here, a half acre here, two acres over here on the same farm. If you own land adjacent to your family and you want to plant an acre on yours and an acre on theirs, that cannot be on this, or two acres on theirs and one acre on yours to a total three. You cannot do that. It has to be on the same named farm, and so it has to be under the same, um, you know, uh, entity name there. And so the minimum is three acres. That has to all be done in one year, and um, you usually have about 12 months to do that. Keeping in mind that, of course, the planting seasons are only in the spring and fall, and so um, when they give you 12 months to do it, of course, that window is cut down. Lisa, do you have? Can you just do chestnuts? 
or can you do three, have to do three different varieties? How does that work? I, I, I would think uh, that's an excellent question at all. Um, no, you cannot just do chestnuts. Um, and the reason is what Tom had mentioned that somebody asked the question, do you want to do all chestnuts? And no, we have learned over the years, we used to plant during using these cost share programs of CRP and the REIT, we used to plant four species. Red oak, white oak, walnut, and ash, okay? Well, red oak, we have seen in those rows, single species row of red oak, single species row of ash, single species row of walnut, single species row of white oak. We have seen not only the disease issues of oak wilt as it affects one tree in that row and moves through the roots right down the line to all those other trees, um, all those people who planted those four species that we recommended for years, all good species, by the way, native, a good uh, hardwood species, but one of the three of those is now pretty much uh, getting to be, uh, ex uh, I don't want to say extinct, but it is, it is going by the wayside from our emerald ash borer. And if we've learned nothing from the emerald ash borer, um, something that I like to say is, you know, when we replanted our streets and our neighborhoods after the Dutch elm disease went through in the 60s, we use this awesome, fast-growing, great shade tree called ash. And now we're seeing that history repeat itself in that some streets and some neighborhoods are going to be, all, again, completely devoid of those very needed and very useful shade trees. And so we do not know what the next emerald ash borer is going to be. And so diversity could not be more encouraged. And so um, what I tell people anymore is if you're going to plant an acre of ground or more, I would really like to see at least five different species. Something else that we've been doing is um, looking at shrubs. You know, they are a great companion to so many of our tree species. And I believe that, um, Tom, did you already talk about you know, some of your companion plantings um, that you're going to learn there? And so, um, you know, some of these shrubs are, of course, a great long-term companion to your chestnuts, not messing up your um, the harvesting of your chestnuts because these are small, you know, 10 and 8 foot spread and height shrubs that can be very good um, companions with that. And also, um, I work with some chestnut growers down in Lee County who uh, long ago planted uh, chestnuts within their multi-species tree planting and have just over the years thinned out some of those other trees to allow for their good harvesting and good crop production of their particular trees. In fact, when we went through and de were deciding which trees to harvest, they actually knew, well, this, this chestnut is actually a really good producer. We really want to open up around there and thin some of the other trees that we planted. And this chestnut tree really never did anything for us. And so if we let the walnut or the oak go next to that one, um, that, that's what we did. And so diversity is very encouraged. And using these cost share programs, it is um, required. Now, um, I'll get to this in uh, just a second. But I think that there's a very, very happy medium between long-term chestnut production and using these cost share programs. So um, aside from the three acre minimum of a project area for tree planting, and because I just want to let get out to all you possible women donors that there's cost share for this timber stand improvement practices, that's a five year minimum. And then um, there's a 20 year maintenance agreement that you sign with your soil and water conservation district that's who your contractor agreement is with. And again, that's Soil and Water Conservation District is the same as NRCS in the uh, Government Service Center in every county. And that 20-year maintenance agreement says that you will leave that as the practice for 20 years. You will not clear that to build something. You will not uh, uh, graze that or allow it to be grazed if you have a neighbor who grazes next to you. You use the Iowa fence law and each do your half is needed to um, protect the animals from uh, coming into your tree planting area. And even though every tree that you plant certainly isn't gonna survive, the idea is to maintain the, um, the basic premise of the tree planting practice for that 20 years. So it's not as if somebody is going to come back at year 15 and say, you know, wow, this is kind of sparse or this isn't exactly what 
what we thought. Um, it's just something that as long as there's not a house there, a pond there, um, grazed or, you know, with any kind of a goats or sheep or, you know, anything used as, used as a pasture, all those things are not allowed and that's what that maintenance agreement is really doing. But, you know, of course I would argue that if you're going into tree planting, whether it's for chestnut production or any kind of long-term management for trees, you're looking at a longer timeline than 20 years anyhow. And so um, hopefully this 20 year maintenance does not bother anybody. Now, that 20 year maintenance does transfer with the land. If you sold, if you used a re tree planting contract and you 10 years later sold your ground, it would still be under a re tree planting contract when it transferred to that next owner for that balance of 10 years or eight years or however many um, was the balance. And I have argued to people, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that having a conservation practice on your land would be a, a positive selling point in a lot of cases. And um, since the cost share is just a reimbursement for uh, work completed, I think that if you ever did run into an issue, um, the thing to do would be to either as the seller or inform your buyer that if they wanted to do something else with that ground, they would pay back the cost share that was given. And we'll get, get into what those amounts are in just a little bit here. But what I'm getting at is this elected board that decides when to cost share these projects um, are your local farmers out of your county. You know, these are reasonable folks that if you came in and had to, you know, uh, tear out your own planting 10 years later, again, I think they'd be willing to work with you and be reasonable and not be looking to punish anybody for doing, trying to do a conservation practice. Did, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you had a question, sir. I, I saw your hand up. Um, so, uh, 20 year maintenance, three acre minimum for tree plantings using REAP, go ahead. You see, you can't put any grease on it. Are you allowed to mow around that? Yes, he asked it, you, if you weren't allowed to graze, are you allowed to mow? Absolutely, it is recommended, and uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Thank you. So, um, if somebody comes to me tomorrow and says that they want to do a tree planting, you <laughs> agree, we're going to plant around 600 to 700 trees per acre. That's a lot. Um, we're looking at somewhere by, um, you know, 7 by 10 spacing, 8 by 10 spacing, 8 by 9 spacing, to achieve those kind of numbers there that we're talking about with the 600 to 700 trees per acre. Now, the reason that we do that is because unlike planting, um, let's say you just started out doing a brand new chestnut planting, um, and you would tube every one, and you might space those farther apart at that. What's the initial spacing recommendation? Is it starting out at 20 if somebody was just going to plant? Yeah. Okay. And so um, you tube as or protect every one of those as top set. Well. The idea when planting bare root, high density tree, seed, tree and shrub seedlings is that deer are going to get some, rabbit are going to get some, uh, deer or weather and uh, extremes and flooding and drought are going to get some. And so we plant a very high density knowing that those are going to be thinned out over time naturally at maturity. Now, um, I walk into some plantings 15 years after the fact where there was great survival, and now these people are going to have more work on the back end of things to do some thinning periodically. I've also walked into plantings that have poorer survival, and they usually have slower growth on their trees because of the high grass competition, and I'll get more into that in just a second. Um, but Tom talked about that, that, you know, not having tall grass and not doing the chemical weed control around those seedlings really uh, uh, um, is deficient to their growth or slows down their growth significantly. And so um, so that's why we plant, because we're using bare root uh, trees and not protecting everyone, that's why we do that high density planting, okay? And I'm going to get how chestnuts fit into that, I think, really well. Um, what we ask as part of the cost share that we give you is that you plant those trees at that approximate uh, number per acre that you do the maintenance, not only to prep the field for planting, to make sure that there isn't tall weeds or the problem species in there to begin with, and then that you do the maintenance after planting, which includes mowing periodically, you know, on drought years two or three times a year, on flood years, so you know, five or seven times a year, and then do that one chemical spray. And that is what we ask for the cost share that we get, that you do, that you purchase the trees and plant them, that you do the first year chemical spray around the base of the trees, and then you mow or maintain it for at least two or three years. 
Now, it is recommended that you spray for more years than that, and using a different program, it's actually, there's a cost share associated with it. REAP is a one-time reimbursement payment, and so the only thing you're going to get <coughs> for is that first year spray, the trees, the labor. And um, so if somebody walked in and wanted to do a tree planting, we'd be doing six to 700 trees per acre. I'd be telling them to uh, prepare the site correctly to get those trees in and to do the mowing that first year and the spray that first year around the base of the trees. And that is what the cost share covers. And so um, how that fits in with chestnuts is, I think, really well. So even if you had a three-acre tree planting, and even if you used a diversity of, let's say, eight or nine different species, um, maybe 20% of those are chestnuts, which if we look at our spacing, um, that isn't maybe quite the spacing of the 20 by 20 that you need initially, but it certainly is more than the spacing of the 40 by 40. I think that 20% would be like a 30 by 30 spacing or right around there. And so um, uh, in my district, which every district is different in Iowa, and every forester has had different um, uh, experiences and seen different failures or successes that drive the way that they do things. Every NRCS office or FSA office is a little bit different with some of their rules or what they will or won't allow. And so a very big caveat here is that you have to check with your individual district forester. I myself would be okay with even 25 to 30% of chestnuts if there was a good diversity of seven or eight other species that made up that other 75, um, 70 to 75% even. But I think even 20% of chestnuts would still allow you that um, good end result of what you're looking for. Now what I'd suggest is the maintenance, here again, the REAP would cover um, getting most of the trees, uh, doing the chemical spray around, which would be uh, um, useful for all the trees, not just your chestnuts, and then um, uh, the labor to plant that in. Now you would be on top of the cost you're provided to go ahead and buy tubes of protection for each one of those chestnuts. So you'd be basically planting a large field of a diverse amount of species, but protecting each chestnut in that field, thereby kind of assuring that at maturity, those are going to be the trees that are around. If some of those other trees survive, they're going to train your uh, chestnuts a little bit better to grow up and do some of that self-pruning. They're going to uh, help control the weeds in the grass by shading out and providing a dense canopy for a few years to have that um, competitive grass be um, lessened over the years. And um, then that uh, high density planting also allows, if your soils or your site decided that chestnuts aren't doing good, you have not lost a uh, great conservation practice and that you have some of these other trees and shrubs growing. And, you know, I think there's so many wonderful companion species. I think, you know, Tom talked about some of them, but, you know, the chest, or excuse me, the hazelnuts and the um, uh, aronia berries, elderberries, you know, some of these native uh, fruit and tree um, uh, products that we're getting, walnuts, um, as you said. Go ahead. So you do include shrubs in your tree planting combination? Yes, yes. Those are perfectly... Um, I would say I prob you probably wouldn't have more than 40% shrub species or 40% of shrubs total on over the overall species, but I think that they'd be yeah, a great addition to any planting. All these are native. All these are providing so much of the same wildlife and food value that some of our trees do, and so I, I think that they're really um, doing the exact same thing that is the um, reason to do this, which is, again, soil and water conservation and putting good habitat on the ground. When you have six to seven hundred trees per acre, what is the feasibility of uh, if a large percentage of them grow because of taking good care of them, can you transplant those out into a larger area? Yes, yes. And so um, as you would thin them out naturally to favor and to manage for the species that you're trying to manage for your long-term goals, I'm sorry, so he asked if if you could thin out some of the trees that you planted initially, when they need to be thin and transplant those other places, absolutely you can. And I would say that, you know, generally you're looking at a tree spade, though, to do that, you know, how these trees established and ripped out, it wouldn't be digging them out. But certainly a tree spade would be um, doable, and um, for the REAP program especially. Um, when you get into CRP, that gets a little bit more sketchy, but um, because of their rules of the number of trees per acre that you have to maintain, but we'll get into that.
Um, so I, I think that the point here is, is that chestnut planting can be very compatible with our state green program. Um, and uh, that just by planting even a 20%. Tom, does that sound, you know, even 20 or 25%, would you say that's sufficient in the total number of chestnuts in a, tr in a tree planting? Um, well, what I, what I would be concerned about is the spacing between the chestnuts. And I'd want a 20 by 20 spacing to start with, which is the only correct spacing for chestnuts. <laughs> 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 to start with. Uh, and then fill in with other things, and, and uh, I guess the, the, the other spaces and the spacing between them would, would be up to you. But as long as we get that 20 by 20 chestnut spacing to start with. That's a great point, and you know, one thing that I think we could do with that is, um, right now if you're in a tree plant and use a machine tree planter, for instance, you would have um, two or three bundles of uh, different species at your disposal for that particular row. And as the tree planter is moving down the line, you'd be grabbing those. Well, um, if you're new to it, you probably would be going very slow, and you'd have your chestnut pile, and know that every third species that in the ground, you're grabbing one of those chestnuts. If you're hand planting, that would be a lot easier to do by maybe setting out flags or something if you're getting help to do that. And so I think that there's a practical way to do it. It just takes some pre-planning to make sure that that end spacing of the chestnuts is well spaced out. As Tom said, the spacing of these other species, as long as you're diversifying them within the row, you can kind of go wild. And if it's three white oaks in a row, it doesn't really matter in the end scheme of things as long as it's not 20 white oaks in a row or, you know, chestnuts or walnuts in a row. So, um, you are required to have a tree planting plan provided by the, uh, I believe you can even write your own tree planting plan, but the basic uh, uh, things that are in there are your soils uh, that tell what kind of species are even compatible for that site, um, what you do for pre-maintenance, uh, how you put those in, the spacing, what you do for post-maintenance, and a list of species. That's basically what the tree planting plan is in mind through the DNR. As a state employee, we also provide information on endangered species and soil and water conservation and kind of snippets of information in that. But it has to be approved by your DR district forester. And so even if you wrote it yourself, I'm sure that they would work with you. Um, and then you sign up through your NRCS soil and water district, three acre minimum, 20 year maintenance, I mentioned that. So read with the 75% cost share program. And you can read what's up there about that um, right now, if you went in to sign up for reef tree planting, the maximum based on the average statewide cost that they'll give you is 600 trees per acre. Well, what I brought with me today is actually back on the back table and it's a state nursery catalog. And what that does is it describes the different species and so on and so forth. At the back page, it has our DNR district forester contact information with a nice map here in Iowa so you can know how to get a hold of your folks. And for those of you out of state, looking through your NRCS um, would probably be the way to find any uh, forestry resource there. But the big thing that you have to know about REAP is that um, the state forest nursery just raised its cost on its seedlings significantly, almost by a third of the total cost. It used to run around six, um, 60 bucks for 100 trees. Now it's about 90 bucks for 100 trees. And so the cost share for REAP has not caught up with that. And so right now, if you went in and signed up for REAP today and did a tree planting, not counting the added cost of chestnut seedlings, you, you'd be maybe, maybe looking at about a 50% cost share because the cost share rates have not caught up to the new um, rate of our average seedling cost. And so that's going to be important to keep in mind that you can uh, find that out through your soil and water district. And we have plans for that cost share rate to raise here pretty soon to hopefully better reflect and, and end up to be that 75% cost share program. But right now, they will cost you up to $450 an acre if your bills come in at $600 or more. Since it's a 75% cost share program, if your bills only came in at $300, they would only be providing you 75% of that for reimbursement. You do all the work, you turn in your bills, and you get reimbursed six weeks later. You have to do that front cost. On the federal, um, so CRP, um, very plainly, it says that you cannot receive income from ground that is enrolled in CRP. I just heard Tom say that using those good tubes and doing all the right maintenance, you could start to get an uh, actual um, 
harvest in four to five or six years. So CRP in a lot of cases is probably not going to be compatible because you would either have to buy it out of CRP, which is pretty expensive, meaning you have to pay back everything that they've given you on the annual, annual rental payment. And I'm sorry, CRP is the Conservation Reserve Program, federal program. And so um, there are a great number of practices for trees, windbreaks, riparian buffers, and general tree plantings that may or may not fit in with chestnuts. But even at a 10-year contract that you'd sign with CRP, I think you're running up against some of those um, uh, rules of being broken with wanting to get your, so at leasing your land for hunting, cutting firewood off of it and selling that, all those things would qualify as getting an income off those acres that you're getting paid for for CRP. So you would want to check with your forester and your NRCS, but I'm going to say that that's generally not going to be um, a good program if you're looking for that quick production on those chestnuts and hoping for that. You'd be getting yourself into some possibly a sticky situation. So another federal program that we're going to use a whole lot of that just raised its prices really well is this EQIP, Environmental Quality and Incentive Program. And that is a federal program also administered through the NRCS. You would also do the work up front, turn in your bills, and get reimbursed. But unlike a 75% uh, rate based on average cost, the EQIP pays a flat rate. So every practice, tree planting, weed control, prairie, pollinator, you get paid a flat rate per acre. Um, there is no acre minimum for equip. However, unlike REIT, that is the first come, first serve, so i.e. as long as you qualified with the number of acres and got in there, you get the money from REIT. With equip, they actually send in all applications for conservation projects, and they are ranked statewide based on the um, conservation needs and how they're fulfilling that. And so if you only have a one acre project, um, it might not rank as high as a three acre project. If you only have a one acre project with only so many trees or only this aspect of tree planting, it might not rank as high as somebody who's also applying for pollinator um, habitat as well as doing a tree planting. And so those are all going to be things to keep in mind. But what's nice through EQIP is that you can get a separate set for herbaceous weed control, a separate set of money for tree planting, and then there are protection in there too um, for possibly tubes. It doesn't nearly cover what some of the tube prices are for those really great five foot tubes that you need. But again, it helps and it's all going towards that. And so uh, again, multiple different practices can be used together. And um, unlike REIT, that you can walk in at any time of the year, and as long as they have money still in their coffers, they'll cost share you and approve you at their next month's meeting. Um, REIT has monthly meetings to approve these projects. EQIP only ranks one or two times a year. So while they might accept applications all year long in your NRCS office, they've just started ranking them here in February. Those people won't get even told if they um, got approved until maybe June, and so the net, you know, so the the weight on that is a little bit more, and the time on that it takes a little bit longer. So it's not as if going into your you know office in April and expecting to be planting in May. Really, for all the programs, ideally you want as much planning as possible to make sure. Um, so uh, again, a plan from your forester is required, no acre minimum, and then for tree planting under EQIP, there's a 15-year maintenance. And real quick, the um, uh, purpose of tree planting um, under EQIP is basically for um, uh, conservation. You know, so it doesn't say nut production. It says to provide erosion control, improve energy conservation and beautification, improve water quality through uptake of soil and waterborne chemicals and nutrients, protect a watershed, improve air quality, provide wildlife habitat control drifting, drifting snow, and store carbon and biomass. And so certainly our plantings all, you know, would encompass those goals. But if you go in and say, my only goal is to have chestnut production, you know, you, you want to let them know that you're, um, some of those other things are important also. Um, and again, you don't have to know that program. Hannah Howard is back here with Trees Forever. And one of the um, uh, outlets that you might possibly be able to get cost share is through Trees Forever. I know they have a buffer program. They have a really neat pollinator conservation program where they're doing some different things. Um, Hannah, is there any other specific specific program people should know about? Nope, so those are the two programs that we have that are avail available for private lands. 
So if you're interested in that, um, I have some cards back here and I'm just about out of the applications. Um, we already have our 2017 projects picked out, but we certainly um, could accept applications at any time for 2018 projects. And so that buffer would be uh, um, doable with chestnuts? Um, at, oh yeah, definitely. We have, of course, it's a program that's focused on water quality, um, but we've had landowners doing all kinds of projects because any perennial vegetation you put in the ground is going to have an impact, a positive impact on water quality. So we've had people that have done shrub plantings of aronias, um, you know, just elderberries, a mix of hazelnuts and all those different kinds of things, or just chestnuts. So you really can do a lot of different things with agroforestry through this grant. Um, and, you know, just that, again, there's so many outlets for you guys to find us, folks. But again, on our state nursery catalogs, I want you guys to know that if you pick one of these up, I have some pretty old ones that have the old prices, but the description of the seedlings and the contact information is basically the same. Um, and there is a few of the new catalogs in the back of that manila envelope, back on the folder, and that shows our new prices. But you can uh, do an easy search to uh, DNR, um, state nursery and get that same information and our updated prices there. And so, I just, I work for NRCS, so I just want to let you know March 17th is the next application deadline. For equip. Okay. And also, we do pay for tree planting plans with private foresters. So you can sign up for that if you want a tree planting plan. And also, the other good point is you can plan out for four to five years and lock in that higher money with one time cut. So meaning multiple different practices and using that? No, if you wanted to do 20 acres of tree planting, you could schedule okay. two to four acres every year for four to five years with one contract instead of coming back in and signing up all the time. Did everybody hear that? Okay, so great. Thank you very much. And so the next EQIP uh, deadline is March 17th. And here again, you know, the wheels turn a bit slowly. And so the sooner the better that you're getting in and doing some of that. And um, I will be available for, at the end of the day. But uh, here again, Kathy and Extension um, know how to get a hold of me. And you guys now do through here. So if you had four years left on my CRC contract, would the read, would that be an option? Four years left on your CRP contract. After that is out of there, yes, um, REAP would be an option now. However, if you, so you're going to want to interplant chestnuts within the old CRP? Right, right now. Okay. Right now, with four years left on my contract. You would talk to your NRCS. I do not know. You can possibly do a modification of a contract, but in the last three or four years, I think that's getting into some air here again, some possibly um, hairy situations. So it might be waiting until that expires, and then maybe using each to even interplant, because I think that there's some single um, interplanting under each of the You can sign up for eclip. I think it's six months before your CRP expires. However, you can't plant any trees until it's out, but at least you can lock the contract. Okay, so six months would be... And just that check, you know, and ask those questions. There was a program called Trees for CRP um, that you could plant trees on the uh, grass ground that used to be in CRP, but here again, those programs come and go, and so check with your IRCS and know what's available based on what you're doing. Thank you, Lisa.